Hi, everybody. Welcome to Wake Up World. Um, we have an amazing episode for you. Um, and <laughs> oh, yeah. How are you doing, David? I'm doing just great. Good, good. Awesome. <laughs> well, we're, first off, we're excited to, um, to be interviewing David today, mm -hmm. talking about a little bit of his history and what has brought him here today and what he does and all of that and eternal nature. And I'm just rambling, rambling, rambling. But. Um, yeah, well, I guess we'll get started with introductions. So this is Kyle. He's uh, an expert in neuro-linguistic therapy and understanding the workings of the mind. And this is Jerusha and she has been, or has been, is an expert <laughs> in intuitive and energy healing as well as body work. She's a LMT and massage therapist. And then she's been doing it for since she was five, six years old. On the energy work On the energy side, work side, not massage therapy <laughs> no massage. side. <laughs> no. Um, and then we got Dr. Morehouse here, David Morehouse. Um, and I'm just gonna, we're just gonna dive, I'm dive right into it. Um, you've got sure. a really impressive background. Um, so I was, we'll yeah. start with, with what I've got here for um, some of your background and introducing you. So, Dr. Morehouse is a former U.S. Special Operations Army officer in the Republic of Panama. In the 1980s, he commanded the U.S. <clears throat> Army's uh, uh, only separated airborne rifle company. Um, after suffering a closed head wound uh, in the Kingdom of Jordan, where a stray machine gun... <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. Let me... I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's okay. It's, <laughs> it's because we were just so the audience knows we were all like yakking away talking about all this different kinds of stuff and stuff and back and forth before we came on here. So yeah, yeah, no, you don't need to introduce me like that. I can. It, it's okay. Well, okay. We'll I mean, we diving into it anyway. So yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Look, uh, uh, it's. I have. Uh, you know, I've written a couple of books and that are out there like Psychic Warrior Inside the CIA Stargate Program. Uh, and we'll get to where why that book was was uh, written uh, and what it's about uh, later. And then they, all the other books and things that were there that I've done. But, I mean, you were on it. You were tracking with it. it I was, uh, you know, I was an, a, a career Army officer. And <clears throat> it's like, I was asked once why, you know, I became an army officer and it wasn't really a choice for me. It was kind of in my DNA. You know, my grandfather was an army officer, career mm -hmm. army officer, uh, as was my father was a career army officer. Uh, and then me, and now my son is a command sergeant major uh, of a military police battalion uh, and, you know, has deployed to Afghanistan twice. And it's just, in our DNA to serve in, in that way, to serve and to be warriors in the service of our nation. And there's just not an escaping of it for me. So having done that, I ended up being uh, assigned to uh, the, the Republic of Panama was my first assignment. And I spent over six years there first, which was kind of an unusual time because that was a time when uh, <clears throat> during the eighties and, uh, through that time frame, we were, we were at war with communism, right? The cold war was hot and heavy. It still is by the way, but then it was hot and heavy. And, you know, the, the Soviet union, uh, had all of its interests throughout various satellites of central and South America. And you either had dictatorships that were supported by the United States, uh, which people complain about, or you had dictatorships that were supported by, you know, Soviet states, which everybody complains about, or you had, you know, very few just successful countries on their own that were down there. But we were very much concerned about the expansion of communism, uh, particularly in what we were considering our backyard during that time frame, and so. I felt very privileged to be in that place because other than just being a guy serving on the, you know, on the, on the full to gap in, in Europe, which was really kind of the front line, I felt like I was in the really only kind of shooting war that was going on, which was in central and South America. 
So I, I went there, I had a really interesting thing. And the first place I show up is uh, my first company commander is James J. Pelosi. Now, Pelosi was the only uh, West Point cadet to ever have been silenced by <laughs> the cadets there because he was accused of cheating on an exam, which he maintained his innocence, but they uh, held a court, uh, you know, a, a cadet court, and as they do, and you're supposed to ad abide by the decision of that, your peers, and he chose not to. Now, so in doing that, he they couldn't make him leave, so he didn't leave, and he stayed there for the next two years, but he was silenced which meant that nobody would speak to him for any reason other than to issue a direct order to him. <clears throat> so I just thought it is, you know, as one looks at one's life and you think where you start in and the kinds of people that just seem to be put in your pathway, that as you're making your journey through life, that how do you get to learn? But to be exposed to all these different varieties of people in life, right? So here is this guy who was just completely stricken by his environment. And he was a frail looking kind of a guy, not a big beastie warrior kind of guy, but you know, he stood up to hundreds of cadets and an administration that supported how he was treated and I know any West Pointers that are listening to me right now are thinking, bastard, you know, you're talking about because you're not supposed to, you know, you, you won't condone lying and cheating or stealing or anybody who supports anybody else who condones that kind of stuff. So I was just kind of amazed that this guy had gone through all of that. And we used to spend a lot of time when I was out in the field with him just talking about stuff because I, I, wanted to know what that was like to have been at West Point and then to have been completely shut down by and hated by everybody around you and how you found the courage within yourself to get through all of that. And so I, he started giving me these wisdoms, which I, at the time, kind of half thought were valuable, but throughout the rest of my life now, as I've looked back over that kind of thing, I keep thinking, what an amazing miracle to have had somebody, right? Like that goes through that kind of a beginning to give you these little tidbits about why they stood their ground and why they thought, you know, that that was unjust and how they were being treated, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, somebody made a movie of his life, Silenced, and there's a book written, Silenced, by him. Uh, if anybody's interested in that, I don't even know if he's still alive today, but anyway, he was there. My first company commander. So <clears throat> I learned a bit from him. And then afterwards, um, I had another group of men like the, my battalion commander and other stuff. And I want to accelerate this because I could talk all day about that, my, oh, my, just my military stuff. But let me accelerate through it. So I end up uh, being an aide to one general who is the general who was just in 1974 I'm his aide now. I became his general's aide in 1979. This guy in 1974 is given the mission to reform the 1st Ranger Battalion, which is the first time that that had been done since the Korean War. It's a huge thing in the military to, to know the story of this guy, General Kenneth C. Luer, and what he did. He was the most amazing trainer and leader, as far as I was concerned. I learned so much from him. I was just a sponge of everything that he said and did. And not that I wanted to be like him, but I wanted to be like him, you know, kind of a thing. So he, after him, then I, I end up uh, being assigned when he leaves, I end up going to the only separate airborne rifle company, <laughs> not separated airborne rifle company, but you, that's, you could say it that way too. It's the army's only separate airborne rifle company, which at that time, it, there are airborne units in the army. Like there's the 82nd airborne division. There is the, uh, at that time it was the 509th, I think in Vicenza, Italy. And there were the 
uh, the Ranger battalions, they all have airborne status, but there was only one separate airborne rifle company. And it, that company worked for the commander in chief Southern command, which is the four star position. And they are his, uh, considered to be his, uh, his ready reaction force. So I asked for, and based on how I had performed as an officer up to that point in time, I was given command of that company, which was an amazing opportunity because I stepped in there as a, as a first lieutenant, barely um, outranking the young officers under my command. And I ended up being there. And fortunately for me, I had really good young subordinate officers and really amazing non-commissioned officers and soldiers that were there because they all made me look good. And I stayed there for as long as I could, uh, nearly two years. And then afterwards, when I left, I was recruited into the Ranger Battalion. So I went to 1st Ranger Battalion. Uh, and while I was there, I served as an operations officer, assistant operations, I mean, assistant operations officer, uh, a uh, the S-1 personnel officer. And then I was given my co company of, uh, to command. So now I'm commanding Bravo Company, uh, first Ranger Battalion, uh, which was the pinnacle of my career. Absolutely bar none. The, the quality of the non-commissioned officers and the quality of the junior officers and the leaders above me were the finest that the U.S. Army had to offer in the special operations community as far as I was concerned. So once again, um, I was in a, a wonderfully blessed place to learn all that I could learn from the greatest people around me, both above me and below me. And so <clears throat> my company uh, was considered an extremely well-trained, highly combat ready company. So we were selected by the commander joint special operations command and the Ranger regimental commander all the way up through the army leadership one ranger company was selected out of the entire U.S. Army to go to the Kingdom of Jordan to train Jordanian rangers. So one of the places where I went there was a place called Bath el Ghul, the belly of the beast, or it's a haunted valley, uh, and it's in southern Jordan. And while there, uh, we were training Jordanians, and people cringe when I say this, but who would we be training the Jordanians to fight? There are Arabs everywhere, and they share a border with one perceived enemy, uh, Israel. So <clears throat> we were training Jordanians to ultimately to fight Israelis, if that ever came to be. I questioned that. Others questioned that. Uh, the answers were never given because why would they be? And it was a really difficult thing because I had Jewish rangers. I had Jewish kids in my, in my company, but nonetheless, we were chosen to go there because they, the company was good and we were extremely proficient at doing the kinds of things that we needed to be capable of doing and training others to do it as well. So we did. Now in this Valley, <clears throat> there is, uh, the Hodge road, uh, the road to Mecca. Uh, and also in this Valley, is a railroad track. It's the narrow gauge railroad track that was blown up. Uh, it was built at the turn of the century uh, into the 20th century by the Germans under contract to the Turks. It's the railroad that Lawrence of Arabia became famous for blowing up with his Bedouin raiders in World War I, right? And actually, <clears throat> I blew that same railroad up. And here's my piece of it that I brought back with me, right? Oh, that's man. my piece of railroad. That's what a pound of C4 will do to a rail. And there it is. I brought this back. This landed 600 meters away from where we blew it up. It landed behind me. So we didn't get our calculations right because they're supposed to be, you know, you calculate a fan about where you're, and you have to be outside that fan. So my NCOs who were doing that, I didn't check it. 
<laughs> so it did land like stuck in the ground like that, uh, like 15 meters behind me. So we were inside that fan. Shouldn't have been. So <laughs> this place is a haunted valley. And at night, the Jordanian soldiers who are, I guess, easily frightened about certain kinds of things, but you would hear them screaming at night. Not all of them, but I mean, occasionally a few of them in the different little encampments that were there in their tents. And it was being explained by the battalion commander that yes, you know, they're not well educated and this kind of, and they, this is a haunted valley. And so they believe that they're hearing things and seeing things and other stuff there. And that's how he explained it to me and my officers. Well, <laughs> Haunted Valley, Hodge Road, Railroad, all these things going on there. And during one of the exercises that we're working with the Jordanians, my one of my platoons is going through, and we have a Jordanian machine gun unit attached to my uh, to my uh, support by fire position. And in that place, a Jordanian machine gunner, it is thought to have on purpose to try to kill some Americans. <clears throat> when the shift fire signal went out from the platoon leader who had just made contact with the, with the, with the, uh, the obstacles protecting a bunker complex and they were going to breach the obstacles and then kill the first bunker, they gave a signal to shift fire off of that bunker and cover the other nine bunkers. And what happened was at that point, a machine gunner from the Jordanians swung his machine gun to the left, the barrel to the left, and he fired somewhere, they estimate, between 75 and 100 rounds of grazing fire, which is like one meter off the ground. And oh, he, wow. swept, because he swept the gun back and forth through the assault element, which were rangers. And all of my, uh, of that assault element, uh, there were a bunch of them that had like holes in the blouse, in their blouse, like, so their arm was up or something else and the, and the round went through and po poked a hole in their blouse. It's not as tight as fitting as a shirt, but anyway, uh, one had, one of my sergeants had a, the top of his canteen shot off. Uh, it, it was just some crazy stuff going on there and nobody was hit. Nobody was hit except me. So <laughs> I got hit in the head. You like the show and tell? I got hit in the helmet. Okay. See the helmet hole there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Okay. All right. So it, it actually didn't go through in the inside. Uh, that's because after you have an incident like that, there's a, a what's called an AR-15-6 investigation, and that occurred there. And when that investigation happened, they dug that out to go see what was actually going on there. But, but anyway... When I was hit in the head, a machine gun bullet travels from an M60 machine gun travels roughly 2,800 feet per second, okay? And so you don't see it coming. Uh, you don't hear it coming. You do hear them when they miss, but you don't, you, you don't have a chance to duck, right? Mm -hmm. So it zinged me in the, in the helmet, which snapped my head back, and it depressed the Kevlar because Kevlar is layers, it depressed the Kevlar down on my head and it hit me hard enough to raise a big lump and give me a big hematoma. And I was knocked out. I didn't know I was knocked out and, and I didn't recall at all thinking oh, I'm knocked out kind of a thing. But suddenly my focus and my awareness was to another place, uh, and it wasn't a dream state because how I saw it and was experiencing it, I, I distinctly remember being aware and saying to myself, I'm not dreaming. I'm, I'm not dreaming this because it was, it was coming to me in a different form than in a dream state. But still, I was aware that I was there and there was an interaction that I had with a being uh, I, you know, I called it a guide or a messenger, or it could be called an angel. It could be called a whole bunch of different things, but I just understood it as a guide and I was receiving information and direction and other things that 
that began to change how I was seeing myself in my career path. Uh, so when I came to on the desert floor, uh, my soldiers, my rangers were there, a couple of them shaking me, you know, kind of slapping me and sir, sir, you know, cause they'd taken my helmet off and the medic was come up, was over there. And, uh, they brought in the physician, I mean, the, the battalion surgeon who was deployed with us. And I ended up going to Amman and getting x-rays and all that kind of stuff. And I was really, really, uh, set on making sure that I was okay or that I told everybody that I was okay. And I didn't tell everybody what happened to me mm -hmm. because as a ranger officer or as a, a ranger senior NCO, those kinds of things, you can't get hurt and stay there. Um, if you get hurt and you're not deployable, they won't keep you, especially in a command position. So <laughs> I didn't come to and say, boy, you won't believe what just happened to me out there. And I say that kind of half jokingly, but seriously, I really meant not to say that because I know what would have happened. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> So I ended up uh, being given the blessing of, okay, you're okay. And uh, during the days that followed, aside from having a big hematoma on my head and being sore and uh, still pondering what was going on and what happened to me and what it was all about, um, I did two things. P two people I talked to about it. One was the Jordanian battalion commander who said to me, uh, at that time started opening up more about what the significance of the valley was and about the fact that his his soldiers were uh you know afraid of that place because of the spiritual nature of that place like there was like a thinning of the veil between uh realities of that place and so he shared all of that with me at that time uh and took what i said and understood kind of what had happened without really digging in and getting more details. Next person I spoke to <laughs> was the battalion chaplain. Uh, and I spoke to him about it because I wanted to say to him that, you know, this happened to me and what do you make of it? Kind of a thing. Do you think that it was a, you know, a, really an angel or was it like, was that something from heaven? Did I cross over? You know, what happened? And this is really key. Hmm for you to get this because <clears throat> he was kind, the chaplain, but he also looked at me like I had two heads, right? <laughs> so <clears throat> it's okay to be a chaplain and it's okay to pray to God. It's okay to believe in God. It's okay to all these things. But if you say that you saw something that, he thinks only comes from the pages of the Bible or that can be ascribed in a miracle or whatever else, right? You have now crossed over a comfort line for them yeah. and you can no longer be, you know, factored as normal or anything else. So I felt with him that I had truly crossed the line because this guy never saw, he never looked at me or talked to me in quite the same way again. Mm. Long story short, go back to the unit and, you know, a few months or weeks pass. And I keep having these things at the time that I called out of body experiences. And I, I was enamored with it. So I began to study and read and, you know, look up all kinds of things and, you know, this and that. And I remembered, uh, I remembered getting access to stuff that I had looked at, looked at, uh, in like 1980, when I was at uh, the 82nd Airborne, I mean, at the uh, 193rd Infantry Brigade headquarters, uh, I had access to and read some at some of the uh, first Earth Battalion stuff, some of the Delta Force concept paper things that was floating around and it was floating around in special ops communities. But I happened to have been out at 3rd of the 7th Special Forces Group, and that's where it was because... Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Cannon, who uh, Channon, who wrote uh, and was kind of the father of the First Earth Battalion, uh, and worked in support of the Delta Force concept paper, <clears throat> which at that time was a rebuilding of the of the Army to be a completely different organization. 
and the army leadership wasn't really sure what the army was going to look like in the new all volunteer army. Because remember, after Vietnam, the army made the decision to do away with, all the services did, to do away with the draft. So now all of the services were drastically trying to figure out, okay, well, how are we gonna bring people to our service? How are we gonna convince them to do it? And how are we gonna keep them there? You know, And what are we going to do to change how the nation sees us? So all of that started to be part of this thing called the golden sphere concept, which was dealing with like special operations things. Uh, <laughs> that's where remote viewing came in. Uh, First Earth Battalion was part of the Delta Force concept paper package that was going on and identifying all this stuff. So I started reading some of that stuff and then I started seeing things about you know, stuff that was going on. I didn't see anything about remote viewing at all, though, I, but I saw a lot of other things. So the next thing that happens is <laughs> it comes time for me to give up my Ranger company, and I do. And uh, when that happens, you are destined as a, an officer who has commanded twice and been on a general staff, etc. You're going to go to be um, – recruiting command ROTC component duty or to uh, a reserve component duty. I didn't want to do any of those things. Those three R things were just horrible as far as I was concerned. I didn't want to be a guy that was like running at speed of light and now suddenly going to be in recruiting command or ROTC duty or anything else. So I got busy talking to some to colonels and to others and saying, you know, what should I do? Where can I go? Any ideas, that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. I ended up being recruited into uh, an organization codenamed Royal Cape. This became my first journey into what are called special access programs. Uh, for those that don't know, when you be go into special access, you go off of your, your normal assignment officers hand your file over to what is called the, in the Army, the Department of the Army Special Access Roster. So now your file is no longer handled at, at that time on, uh, you know, on the sixth floor of the Hoffman Building. It's now going to be handled on the fourth floor, and it's going to be handled by, uh, you know, people that have top secret clearances and handle people going into top secret things. <laughs> yes. Is, it, is that where you would get the terms of, like, black ops? Kind of black, stuff. black ops, but it's it's black book is one of the other words that are used for black book assignments, and it means that you're going to have to be uh, recruited and accepted and then read on, and there are there are incremental read ons that you get. So uh, in the recruiting process, they don't buy you lunch and say, "Here's everything you're going to be doing. Uh, do you want to go do that?" Because they can't do that because a lot of people would say. Hell no, you know, no, I don't want to go do that. I don't want to do that. And then they'd be like, oh, but I just told you everything. Now you can't say anything about it and you know what would happen, right? Guy would go home and go, you won't believe these guys what they just asked me to do today kind of thing. So they don't do that. <laughs> so uh, I ended up, it's a funny story how I got there because <laughs> I I went and had to stay at this at this like Holiday Inn and I'm standing at the Holiday Inn and I get a phone call to my room and it is a guy from the unit. And he says, tomorrow morning, <clears throat> I want you to be down uh, outside the hotel and I want you to go out the east entrance of the hotel and make sure you have a copy of the Washington Post under your arms, so under your left arm. And I'm like, you know, I hung the phone up and I'm looking around in the room like, did anybody else hear that besides me? You know, and then I start worrying, right? I'm like, well, where do I get a copy of the Washington Post? And well, <laughs> does it need to be like tomorrow's? And, you know, so I'm running downstairs going, you know, when does the, when did the Washington Post get here? You know, when, can you save me a copy? All this kind of crap. And I mean, I was that naive and that stupid that I, I was actually running around and doing that. <laughs> so the next day I walked outside and these two guys pull up in a Chrysler K car. I don't know, most Americans are not old, not old enough to remember Chrysler K cars, but Chrysler was going bankrupt. And so they designed a car, which is 
close to the equivalent of a Russian Lada, you know, or something made in China, uh, <laughs> you know, a Chinese motor brand. I mean, they were just really horrible, cheap, rattly little cars, but they it saved Chrysler. So because the government bought them. So they pull up in a Chrysler K car <laughs> and these guys drive me off to this place and they get on a radio and call and the door opens up. They pull into this big warehouse, door closes behind, and there are all these buildings inside buildings that are there. These are secret compartment and information facilities, skiffs. So I, I end up getting recruited into this organization to be uh, a deputy executive officer at that place. Now, I never used to talk about this unit anytime I told this story, never. Uh, the unit was codenamed Royal Cape. <clears throat> it was called the Intelligence Support Activity or the Activity. And the reason I feel comfortable in saying to you what it is now, uh, because some guy wrote a book called Killer Elite. And Killer Elite is the entire story of that unit. I mean, he exposes stuff about that unit that I didn't even know about. And I was like next to the commander, the deputy commander, the XO and me, that those four people, right? Mm -hmm. And I never heard about some of these things. I mean, I saw stuff that was hanging on the wall in the commander's office. But when you're in organizations like that, you're told don't ask questions. You know, you don't ask about that stuff because you're not supposed to know the story. It's compartmentalization. <clears throat> I can't know what operation they were on that caused somebody to award the commander at the time with a blow dart gun, which is now hanging on the wall <laughs> inside the commander's office, right? Or some other thing, you name it, just that kind of stuff. So you don't, you don't ask those questions. But while I'm there, <clears throat> you go through a psychiatric evaluation when you get there in every six months. Why? Because the nature of the work there causes families to unravel, marriages to disappear. You know, their guys there were on like their fifth and sixth marriage, no exaggeration. Wow. <laughs> and it was just a weird place, both from the admin logistical side and training side and from the actual operator side. And it was a distrusted place because John O'Marsh Jr., the secretary of the army at the time, knew that the organization existed, the activity existed, but so distrusted the activity, despite the capabilities and honor of the commander that was there, demanded that any time that any individual assigned to that unit moved anywhere outside a 50 mile, ra 50 mile radius, I think, of Washington, DC. It might've been a five mile. Anytime anybody moved out, it had to be 50 miles. He had to be briefed on that movement and he had to approve that movement. So as the guy briefed, so I had to go up with like these stacks of things and say, okay, and this guy, you know, code name is going to be moving from here to there to go do such and such. And this guy, and, and he would approve each one or disapprove or ask for disapproval pending further information. That was my life there. But <laughs> while uh, I went to my second meeting with the command psychologist and he asks, you know, like, how are you feeling? What's going on? Uh, you know, issues, questions, you know, concerns, kinds of things. The first one I went through, I was kind of clammed up and shut up and didn't say anything. The second one I went through, I was said, I felt more comfortable. And I thought, you know, maybe this guy might actually help me because I continued to have these like, uh, like out nightmarish out of body experiences. And some of them were really journeys out of the body. I mean, I just, that I just wasn't in control of it. I was fascinated by it and I continued to read and I was trying to find things that could help me better understand it and maybe control it and stuff. So I shared that with him, this command psychologist to expect that maybe he would have an idea, right? Maybe somebody else for me to talk to. Mm. Well, he had some an idea for me to talk to somebody else because what ended up happening was over like the next 
nine months, nine, 10 months, I was recruited uh, to become, uh, to go to a place at Fort Meade, Maryland to become a psychic spy, uh, one of America's remote viewers. Mm. So I went there, I was brought in. I, I met a man by the name of Fern Gavin, who was the program manager there. I met a lot of the other uh, folks that are out there talking about remote viewing now. Uh, and uh, I, I asked, you know, I sat down with Fern and Fern said, you know, hey, I'm always impressed. There are young officers that are willing to give everything up to come and be a part of this. And uh, I kind of swallowed hard because I had my efficiency report. I had two efficiency reports written by general officers that said, destined to wear stars, will be a general one day. Now, I mean, lots of guys have to be careful about believing their press in an officer efficiency report, myself included, but there are not a lot of generals that write about a, a, a junior officer destined to wear stars or you know, will be a general officer one day. Those are, those are just powerful things to have in an OER. And then when a guy says to you, I'm happy that you're willing to give everything up to be here, to be a part of this, I really had to say to him, look, I, I don't know that I'm willing to give anything up and I really don't know what it is you do here. So I got some ideas about things that you're doing here based on stuff I've reading. So now let me just put a pin on that. And, and that I just want to tell you what I was given to read, okay? And then if you have a question, you can ask me and I'll, because now we'll be up at the remote viewing in it. So... <laughs> The first night this psychologist hears me talk about the out-of-body experiences, he says, uh, okay, and he walks over and he opens up a big file safe and he pulls out these folders that mark top secret grill flame on them. And uh, he hands me two of them and he says, I want you to read those and then give me your assessment of those in the morning. So I go back to my office and I remember we're inside a skiff so I can keep that document. I just can't go anywhere with it. And I, and I read that and as I'm reading it, it has some unique properties to this document that are unlike anything else I read for the military. Uh, number one is nobody's referred to by name. They're all numbers. That's weird, right? So the next thing is it's clear to me that one person is telling the other person what to do and the other person that's being told what to do is telling the other person what they're seeing, okay? That's clear in what's going on in the reading and the text. <laughs> but then, like on page two, it comes to this one place where there's a there is a a view a number a person numbered says to the other person, okay, are, are you outside the building where you're supposed to be? And the other person says, yes, I'm outside the building now. And then the other person says, good. Now pass through the wall and describe the contents of the room. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> ah, you know, so I, I reread that like 20 times and then I just keep reading and reading. And then it's like, it's this, uh, it's just unbelievable. I mean, it's, it's not that it's unusual. It's that it's, it's us doing this it's like our government you know it's like the millet that we're doing this it's it's like this uh, there's a guy's floating and passing in and around stuff and uh, you know looking at things and describing stuff that's going on and he's describing you know dimensions and textures and and smells and tastes and he's describing you know emotionals and <clears throat> he's describing all kinds of stuff that it would be like the only way somebody could know that is like if they were there and if they like knew the people that were there because he's seeing like beyond the surfaces in, in this description. Well, the next morning I'm outside the guy's office when he comes to work and I go, Oh, you got to tell me more. I mean, what really, you know, really? And, and so he just keeps through the next nine months, nine and a half, 10 months feeding me more and more of these things to look at. It turns out this guy, is a recruiter for the Defense Intelligence Agency and Central Intelligence Agency's Directorate of Technologies and Science, mm. which runs the remote viewing program. <clears throat> now back to Fern, and I say, I don't know what it is you do here. And Fern says, oh, what we do here, young man, 
is we train individuals to transcend space and time, to view persons, places, or things remote in space and time, and to gather and report intelligence information on the same. And we would like you to be one of us. That was the first definition I was given of what a remote viewer does. And then I said, yes, I was recruited into that organization and I spent the next approximately three years uh, being trained as a member of this top secret clan of psychic spies working for the CIA. And uh, according to Dr. Jack Verona, uh, the chief scientist of the Defense Intelligence Agency, overseeing Directorate of Technology and Science, he said in my evaluation that I learned the protocol faster than any other candidate by 48% because they evaluate you, <clears throat> and that I had developed training protocols, and I had, that benefited new people were com that were coming in that came in like after I was there. So after I went through the training, what I realized was these guys really don't have a clue about why they're able to do what they're doing. And they're kind of treating it like it's just like a little, you know, whatever kind of a thing. And <laughs> they don't, have a POI, a program of instruction, and they don't have a manual and they don't have any of these kinds of things. And, you know, when you got through all your training and were deemed operational, then you were handed the CIA's uh, remote viewing manual, which was seven pages long. Seven pages to learn how to be a coordinate remote viewer and didn't even address extended remote viewing or thought incubation or any other things that go along with it. So that was my expertise. And I have to think that there were either one or two reasons that I was recruited into that organization. One, because I was the only combat arms officer, meaning special operations officer, that ever stepped through the door of that particular organization. Everybody else who was there was either a civilian defense analyst or something on the defense side, of DIA or CIA, or they were part of military intelligence, either as an officer or as a senior non-commissioned officer. So you had like guys like Ed Dames. Ed Dames was a, uh, a linguist, spoke Mandarin Chinese. You know, uh, Paul Smith. <laughs> Paul Smith was actually a, uh, I forget what the number is, 35 or 36. So he was like a, a standard intel guy, you know, designed for the trained to plot enemy order of battle on a, you know, on an acetate for the commander, the ground force commander to make decisions based on that intelligence plotting. Uh, and then you had Mel Riley, who was a photo image interpreter. And then you had Lynn Buchanan, who was a computer technician working in the Intel world. Uh, you had Gabrielle Pettengel, who was a, another, uh, a tactical intel officer, uh, and that was it. I mean, and that that though that was the team that was there. You know, other than Angela and um, Robin, and I don't need to mention their last names. And those were two civilian uh, analysts that were there. <clears throat> so I came out of the organization with a complete and thorough grasp of what it was, and in particular, what I was able to do is assign the science to it, the physics of the metaphysics, if you will. And so when it came time for me to do that after teaching it for, oh my God, 15 years, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I was teaching it for, I started teaching in like 96. And so I had manuals that I was producing for it, but they were just all getting there, you know, to where I wanted it to be. And then uh, where did I put it? Ah. Then I wrote this, right? So this is 400 pages of how to do coordinate remote viewing right there, okay? And it's available by Sounds True. Now, listen, if anybody goes after this, don't, it's sold by Audible. It's a, it's a manual, okay? Don't buy, in, buy the audio version of this because it's filled with 
you know, it's filled with graphs and charts and explanations and photos and physics and everything else, you know, to show you about how to make, how to do this and why you're able to do it. Now, do you need this in order to do something? Uh, no, you don't. But if you want to learn coordinate remote viewing, that will teach you how to do it. But you have to buy this hardcover version of it, not, not because it does anything for me, but because that's how you need, you need to have this. And it has a CD in the back of it, right? It's a cool down CD that's in the back of the book and you need that as well. So if you buy the audio version of this, I, it doesn't come with the CD. And it certainly doesn't have all of the, the other educational data that is inherent to this particular topic that's there. And, so, and to also say on that, I know it, it jumps around too. It, it's not just strictly linear through the book. It'll say, hey, jump to this page and then come back here. So that wouldn't really work in Audible. Oh, yeah. oh did we lose your sound? Yeah, I was coughing, so um, <laughs> myself. Sorry. Um, yeah, it, it's that's just an important book to have if you're if you're going to learn coordinate remote viewing. So, well, you probably have a question now. That let's we've got to this place now. So, when I leave, I've got a different perspective on life. And you go ahead and ask me a question if you have one or. If any of the people who are with us have a have a question, yeah. Well, before we get into any questions, let's first off. If you're just joining us, this is Dr. David Morehouse um, talking about. We've gotten to the point. There's a whole lot of information. So if you're just joining us, like rewind a little bit. We went through his history um, in the army and what brought him into the intelligence agency and what brought him into remote viewing. Um, and it's such fascinating stuff. And if you, if you were to just jump in right here and just start hearing about remote viewing and passing through walls and the U.S. government doing this kind of stuff, you kind of like, eh, this seems conspiracy theory, crazy, I'm out. So definitely rewind. There's a lot of information behind that will make it make, make much more sense. Um, so, yeah. And with that being said, do you have any questions, like not from there, but off the cuff with specific um, not specifically. I've just been very intently, like, okay. <laughs> interested in the, in uh, what uh, David has to say. So, okay. So with, um, so I'm sure you've gotten a lot, um, David, of like, I, I don't know what, like, a good way of saying it, except for like, crazy, cuckoo, maybe like, what are you even like talking? Mm -hmm. about? Because whenever you talk about, or whenever like I talk about this kind of stuff, or I hear people talking about this stuff, people, you, you've got both sides. People either go one way or the other. Um, and when explaining this kind of stuff and somebody comes to the table with that kind of comment or that kind of like objection to it, like, what do you say to that when saying that you did this for not only just like a hobby, but you did it for a government? <laughs> Or do you even get that? You probably don't. I don't know. Well, yeah, excellent questions both. And let me see. Let me talk at it for a minute here, and see. If, and I'll check in with you again and see if I've answered the question. All right. <clears throat> um, where did remote viewing come from, and why was the U.S. government doing it? Okay, uh, circa. 1973, uh, the director of the Central Intelligence Agency was made aware through intelligence reports that the Czechs, the Chinese, the Soviets, the Israelis, the British, and some other uh, countries were heavily involved in the study and the use of various paranormal abilities. Mm. And so, as intelligence collection methodologies. And he looked at that and said, based on the reports, well, what's all the interest about? I mean, you know, why, 
why this and why is this happening? And he turned and said, are we doing this? And everybody said, well, no, not that we know of. And his response was, well, then let's figure out if this is something that we really want to get involved in. If everybody else is doing it, there must be something to this on some level. So let's find that out. So enter Stanford Research Institute uh, International in Palo Alto, California. Uh, two names that you hear associated with this, Russell Targ, Harold Putoff, actually 16 other physicists involved with this. Uh, they just happen to be like laser physicists, <laughs> but uh, an entire scientific team gets roughly $50 million. They, they say that it wasn't that. I know that it was that, and it could have probably been somewhere over that, maybe somewhere slightly less than that. But it was $50 million and was the endowment. And they were given a charge by the director of the CIA, which said, okay, you gather whatever you need, right? Whatever gifted, alleged, proclaimed, whatever's out there. And scientifically, you evaluate this for us. You tell us, is there anything to this proclaimed human ability, which at the time might have been just ESP, uh, or, or remote sensing or remote viewing or whatever else, you spend this money and you guys test and you do this and you tell us, and we want to know these things. Is it real? Can you validate it scientifically? Can you replicate it? Meaning, can you come up with a protocol and train people to do it? And can you tell us what kind of person will be good at it so that we can go look for those kinds of people and recruit them if we need them to? And can you tell us somewhere in the range of what the level of accuracy or validity do you think that you're able to produce with this stuff? So circa 76, right, three years later, first report comes out from this scientific study group and they have looked at everything from guys like Ingo Swan to Pat Price to Uri Geller to, you know, uh, a, a baker's dozen of other people who were magicians and, uh, you know, claimed sp sp psychics and you name it. They brought them all in and they ran them through uh, scientific experimentation, blind, double blind, triple blind, uh, you know, uh, using beaconing exercises, you know, randomly assigned uh, target numbers and target lists and on and on and on. <laughs> and so they did this. And the first one they published was in uh, a magazine called the IEEE, okay? The Institute for Electrical and Electronics Engineers. Oh. It is equivalent to being published in, you know, uh, in the Journal of American Medical Association, if you're a physician. Okay, the IEEE is the professional uh, periodical for engineering. And they published in March 1976 under the heading of remote sensory perception, uh, their findings to point at, to that point in research on what remote viewing was able to do. Now, this is the part that is always so amusing to me because being a scientist or considering myself a scientist now <clears throat> is that you rarely, if ever, hear this mentioned by skeptics where they are able to hold it up and say, well, look, uh, you know, clearly they showed that there is, this is total BS. It doesn't work. It can't work. They, you know, they, it was all, you know, and it was a researcher bias. It was on and on and on. <laughs> so they either make some feeble claim like calling research bias or they quibble about how 18 physicists performed their experiments. Now think on that. They quibble with what 18 physicists, clearly scientists, did in their findings and in their experimentation. And they step forward as part of the, you know, uh, two percent of the population that claim that there is nothing beyond the physical, and say it, it, it's all bullshit and it's not real and so forth. They don't.
because they can't, they can say that, but they can't quibble with what SRI International did. SRI came back to the, in 1978, gave their report to the CIA and said, uh, answer your questions. Is it possible? Yep. Uh, did we validate it? Yes. <clears throat> did we replicate it? Yes. Do we have a training protocol? Yes. Uh, do we know which people will be good at it and which one? And they said, yes. Now here's the answer that everybody should listen to who is either listening to this now or in the future. The who will be good at it thing is, they said this is a capability inherent to every human being. You do not have to have some spiritual awakening, some traumatic, you know, awakening, some out of, you know, near death experience, any of these other stuff. Every human being is born with this existence. At some point in life, will all of us be able to do it? Yes. But will all of us be able to do it at the same performance level? No. Can you perfect your skills? Uh-huh. Just like anything else, right? If you learn to play golf at two, like Tiger, Tiger Woods did, oh, wow. now you're going to be a good golfer by the time you're 22. If you don't pick up a golf club until you're 42, you're like, not going to be a really good golfer, you know, for a long time starting. We learn slower as we're older. We have a lot of habits we have to break. Body doesn't function the same way. Anyway, that's the point is that depending upon where you choose to get into the capability or the practice of it will depend on where you happen to slide into it at the moment. There are also other things that are uh, will make you uh, better at it early on, things like attitude, intention. Uh, and I want to talk on that at some point when, if you ask that question, if not, I'll get there. But, uh, you know, attitude and intention and beliefs and all these other kinds of things uh, play a role in all of this. But assuming that you are a normal human being with normal health and normal capabilities, that you could step into this thing and in a very short matter of time, be given an irrefutable, undeniable evidence, evidence, empirical evidence that you are able to see something distant in space-time. Wow. Not some feel good, not some I'll tell you what you saw, not some, you know, that kind of thing. An absolute, irrefutable, undeniable, empirical evidence of what you're able to see. And there are lots of variables that go into that. Uh, there are rules that are applied to remote viewing, things like, you know, you never trust the results of a single remote viewer operating independently of other remote viewers. Uh, remote viewing itself is not a standalone endeavor. It was never designed to be such, and it never will be good at being anything by itself. It was used as one more collector of the intelligence collection puzzle, of the intelligence puzzle. They mm -hmm. used humans, SIGINT, SCIENT. Fodent, Elint, right? All these different intelligence collection methodologies are used and none of them is considered a standalone endeavor. None, not one, not ever in any, any application of, of intelligence gathered by our intelligence services or any other do they rely on one intelligence collection methodology? I, I take that back. <laughs> WMD in Iraq. <laughs> and I say that jokingly, and that's because, uh, you know, at the president at the time uh, took one source, which was a, uh, a source that they had vetted and found was not reliable, at least like the UK intelligence services and CIA and others. Uh, but the president at the time wanted that war, so he went after that war and basically did went after that war citing WMD based on the evidence of one unreliable uh, human in intelligence source. And I may be slightly stepping over my er in my expertise in making that proclamation, but it feels good, so I'm going to do it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> might as well, right? Well, uh, do you... With the with that said, how likely do you feel like um, 
people in the future are going to be recognizing that that this kind of stuff is something that everybody can do like uh, do you see perceive it being something a little bit more widely understood and accepted in the near future well that's a good question um <clears throat> You know, once a, back in the in the really early 80s, CNN did a poll. <clears throat> and in that poll back in the 80s, they asked this question. They said, "How many of you believe that there is something beyond the physical?" That was the that was the question. Not how many of you believe in God or anything like that. How many of you believe in something beyond the physical? In other words, you know, it could be anything, right? Taoism, Confucianism, Buddhism, Christianity, blah, 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 right? It's how many believe that there's something more than just the physical, right? 98% of the responses came back and said, we believe <clears throat> that there was something more than the physical. We believe it. We don't call it God, Jesus, Buddha, or anything, not that Buddha is one of those, but you get what I mean, right? They, yeah. they just said, we believe. That was the answer. <clears throat> 2% said there's nothing, absolutely nothing. Now, Pew uh, Research did a study. I just hold, remember, 98% said there is, 2% said no. Recently, like in 2014, another study was done by a very well-respected research agency uh, who did this same, same similar study. And it came back with, uh, the same statistical evaluation, some slightly different definitions for how cat people fell into categories, different categories, like <laughs> uh, the true non-believers, which were considered atheists, which used to be the real end of that 2%. That now kind of became more of a fuzzy figure because there are a lot of people that who proclaim themselves as atheists because the pure definition of that is that you do not believe in a deity, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you don't believe in an intelligence or that you don't believe in a, a life force or something else like that. It doesn't mean that, right? And the largest country in the world, which is considered uh, an atheist country, is China. And they practice, of course, Confucianism there, right? Yeah. So if you look at that, and they are something somewhere around 500 million, you know, commit uh, proclaimed atheists. But I don't think that you could really say that you are truly an atheist if you're not asking the question, do you believe in something beyond the physical? So anyway, I've spent a lot of time in my life researching that, doing more research and filling and the gaps and answering those questions. And I'm telling you, it falls into the same statistical spread. You've got this minority of 2% that say, I don't believe in anything other than, you know, what I can prove scientifically. So that means I don't believe I'm not agnostic. I'm not a, you know, the new, uh, the new uh, term uh, is something that the Dutch have actually coined. Uh, somewhere around, I think, in 2000, again, 2014, and that's called letism. Letism, L-E-T-S-I-S-I-M, letism. And you are called lettists. And what lettists mean is it's defined as um, or something, right, in, in their language. That's what that means. It means I believe in something. I mean, or, or something, you know, more or less something or something like that's what let means. And so that's why you become a lettuce now. So I think that's just so cool. All we've done throughout the, you know, through the decades since that first study was done, <laughs> it's just, a, it's just to dilute it into different fuzzy measurements or, you know, quantifiables of, of uh, demographic, right. To say our belief structures. Here's what I want everybody to get is that, it's all just a belief. See, the 2% who absolutely say, I believe in, I don't believe in anything, believe in that, that right? They believe that there's nothing out there and they just, you know, 
but they don't want to say they believe, but you do believe it because you can't, can't prove that there isn't anything. You just say you just, because you can't prove that there is in your perspective, it doesn't exist. So you only believe, right? Boy, they really hate it when you say that. You're just part of the belief. You're just another belief structure. So let's go back to the 98%. The 98% back in the original one and still today, they, even though they've migrated into different little categories of, of belief, mm -hmm. of that 98%, the second piece of the question was, okay, if you believe that there is something beyond the physical, do you believe that you can interact with it or benefit from it or learn from it or, at, or you know or anything can you be inspired by it can you just let's just say can you in this physical world in this physical dimension if you believe there's something more than the physical can you interact with that in any way and this is the crushing number <clears throat> 24% came back and said, yeah, I believe that, 24%, <clears throat> okay? That means the rest of that population believes tragically that there is something more than the physical, but that they will never interact with it, benefit from it, learn from it at all. So it's just there. And they are, you know, they believe it's there, but they don't believe that they will ever have any, any, any interaction with it. What is tragic about that for me is because that becomes the statement. That becomes the condition by which we live our lives here. And so you can never achieve your greatness, find your purpose, understand your calling and election in this life. You can never ever get out of your own way if you can't be part of that 24%. And that's why the thing that I'm so excited about with what you're doing here mm -hmm. is the fact that the objective here, aside from healing people, is to is to inspire people through the process of no knowing, of knowledge, right? Knowledge is gained through the experience of doing in the physical and the non-physical. And if you're going to be an institution of learning, especially now, you cannot be something that asks people to accept anything on a basis of faith anymore. Mm -hmm. That stopped at the turn of the millennium. That's why, you know, there were, at that point, there were like 3,800 different, you know, universities of spirit and soul and whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And after to the, the, we went into the 21st century, that died off. There were under 300 that were actually making it. Now wow. there are far less than that. Why? Because the huge percentage of the population just got disinterested. You know, it needed to be, you can't just keep giving me the same old stuff again and telling me, you know, I need to be mindful or I need to be this or I need to be that. No, you need to give me, you need to give me empirical evidence that what you're asking me to do generate something, right? Do you know that there was actually a study done at Brown University on mindfulness where they actually concluded, it was done in the 21st century here. You know, they actually did a, a study and they concluded that, that you can be too mindful. <laughs> well, I, I, yeah, I just really believe that. Yeah, as somebody who's studied yeah. a lot on <laughs> Yeah, mental. you can be too mindful or you can be not mindful enough. And so the question is, how do you get to just my, just the right mindful? Well, there has to be a process, right, of, of empirical evaluation whereby you, you are able to move, measure and move uh, and measure and track the movement of somebody through a particular study or through a particular uh, process, whatever they're going to be involved in. Because 
our objective, those of us that are educators or consider ourselves educators in, in this particular field, are individuals that are now are charged with the responsibility of saying, doing, and trying to be the kinds of things for people that will take that 76% of that population who don't believe that they will ever benefit or interact with something beyond the physical is finding the way to reach that portion of the population, mm -hmm. be it global or be it wherever, right? Yeah. By the way, the global statistical breakdown, as all things in statistics, right? Uh, it, it can be templated over all of the same kinds of things. And globally, it's the same, it's the kind of the same levels. The numbers that change from uh, uh, absolute belief and nothing uh, are, so, again, somewhere between, vary somewhere between, depending on the study, between 2 to 7%. Think about that. 2 to 7% actually believe in nothing. And I argue even based on the studies that I've read that that f extra 5% that they tacked on there mm -hmm. it, it is really not applicable. They really do fall into the or something category, right? They just yeah. don't know how to apply it. That's a small minority of this population that absolutely have given up on anything outside what they can put in their version of, a, of an experiment, right? Which brings me to my next point about that, because you'll hear people, especially people who are going to be uh, asking questions and doing stuff that you guys are going to be teaching and working in, is that <laughs> people will, uh, you'll have people like uh, the skeptical, uh, in, there's a skeptical society, right? Uh, Michael Shermer, and then there are some other people that are attached to it, and they're really, really popular about doing things, or, or they consider themselves uh, very astute about doing certain things, and they'll step up and say, I will give you a million dollars if you can prove that there's something beyond the physical kind of a deal, right? A million dollars. Well, there have been people who step in there uh, who think that they have an obligation in some fashion to step in and try to prove, prove those people wrong. And what all of us who believe these things and think these things or, you know, want to work within these things uh, need to understand that it does not matter what you produce for them. Uh, they are so resolved that there is nothing that you're not going to show them anything to convince them that there is something, right? You just won't. It won't matter what you produce. And, and you'll never earn the million dollars. Okay. That's just a bait for you to jump in there. And people do it. You know, guys like Wayne Carr and, and others have jumped into this thing thinking that, oh, well, I'm going to show them, you know, really what it is. No, because you, you don't understand the rules, you know, never trust the results of one over others. Remote viewing can't Work is a standalone endeavor. It's not how it was intended to work. And, you know, it's never 100% accurate. Never has been. Mm -hmm. But people keep abusing it and other practices by, you know, speaking in terms of absolutes and doing stuff. I mean, I don't think somebody stepping forward that was trained in remote viewing by somebody uh, that steps forward and says, well, I'm going to teach you how to win at the stock market with it. You know, there were two people that did that. They both got hit by the SEC. And the SEC stepped in on that, huh? Absolutely did. And, and, and sued both of them, brought charges on both of them. Uh, and, you know, one claimed to have been married to, you know, uh, a guy that was a remote viewer, but he was actually a monitor, uh, not a remote viewer. And then the other one claimed to have been trained as a remote viewer. I doubt seriously whether he was, but he started telling people and he was, he formed an investment group, like, right? And had people sending him tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. And he was, you know, guaranteeing just like, uh, you know, Bernie Madoff a, a 15 or 18% return on the investment through remote viewing. He was going to do this. I mean, just stupid stuff like that goes out there. And, and, you know, we have to be careful because, Every time something like that happens, 
people are damaged irrecoverably and then you're responsible for the fact that you have now thrown an obstacle, an insurmountable obstacle into that person's path in life wow. that they will likely never recover from. And we're responsible for that, people that do that kind of a thing. So you don't have to engage the negativism that comes from the 2%, right? And you also never want to be in a place where you're promising more than you can actually deliver. And, and you always need to be able to understand an explanation for what healing practice it is that you're involved in. And you need to be able to explain that scientifically. Okay. Uh, it, it can't be something that's attributed to something that cannot be understood or explained in that way. Because if you're doing that, you may get a certain percentage of people that will follow that and have interest in it, but it's never going to be what it needs to be for us to really change the outcome of human destiny. Now, to speak on that point, I mean, we now are 20 years into the fourth turning of the global societal evolution. What is that? Since recorded time, we have looked back over and watched phases that turnings, they are called, that we go through. You know, there is a rebuilding phase, a sustainment phase, followed by an unraveling phase, followed by a destructive phase, followed by another rebuilding, sustaining, unraveling, destructive, rebuilding, sustaining, unraveling, destructive. Those measurements of each of those phases are considered fuzzy measurements of time. So they can be 15 years to 35 years. Some of them have been much longer, depending upon what's happening, like the dark ages, for example, right? Big, yeah. huge, destructive, unraveling, and destructive time. <laughs> so what changes the length of those, whether we expand or contract them, is the global societal involvement in something that's not just anchored in belief, but is anchored in the wisdom of knowledge, of, of, of understanding something through the, uh, the doing of it, right? In the, as we said, in the physical and non-physical. That's our obligation. That's my interest in this. That's why I want to be involved in this because I know that the way we bring ourselves out of this spiral into this prolonged destructive phase is to start inspiring people through the practice of doing something that truly does uh, awaken them, right? To play off the name of the show, to awaken them. And I know that we can't go back to what we did before, uh, before we got to this place now where we are. Because faith is not going to be what pulls us out. It has to be wisdom, knowledge, evidences that we can provide at whatever level that we can provide that for people so that people look at that and know, one, they're part of it and that they are part of the solution and that they have the same ability as anybody else to do any of these things and to learn any of these practices should they decide to say that that's what they want to do. And that is an empowering transition that will occur that will bring us uh, into a rebuilding phase. And I fear that if we don't do that, uh, we're, we're not. We, we've already seen, you know, the, the whole language of belief is becoming so diluted now. That's why there are less Protestants, less Catholics, less Baptist, less all these other things, less Christian, you know, perception and Christian belief. And people are migrating into these other things that are out there. They're still believing in something beyond the physical, right? But they're no longer believing just the same old religious pablum that they've been given for a very long time now. And people that are my age uh, have seen a lot of war and a lot of destruction and a lot of hatred. Uh, from anywhere from racism to you name it. And it has to change. And each of us have a role to play in that. Each of us do. But we can't play it by being a, a, a lettuce. Okay? We have to be, we have to roll up our sleeves 
And we have to start figuring out what it is that we need to do in order to give the evidence necessary to allow people to courageously step across that line from believing and step squarely into knowing. Yeah. That's the only way you affect change is to know something. Believing, believing will not get you there. Yeah, I think it's a good start, um, but you can't stop there. You have to, it's a good first step, um, but you have to keep going because if you stop there, you're, there's movement <laughs> always. Always. Or you're moving backwards and you're going to step back to what is comfortable. And it starts with self-development. You have to trust in yourself, trust that you can do it just like anybody else out there has done it. We're all equal in what we're doing and choosing. And that's, that's the key of everything that we're doing here. Self-development. The healing is just a side, side product. Mm -hmm. The healing is just to be the healing practices, as you, as you said, are, are just there to um, help people that, need a little bit out, uh, extra help in the self-development because the ultimate goal is to be getting from point A to point B. Sure. Yeah. And sometimes people need a little bit extra oomph because it's like you said, there's a lot of war scary things out there that cause us to. Well, there are a lot, there are also a lot of people that are spiritually sick, emotionally sick, mm -hmm. uh, as well as being physically sick. And you're talking about doing a holistic approach to healing for people uh, that taps into all three areas. And I just know that in order to, to do it as powerfully as you can, which I know you will, is that you have to be very disciplined in how you're presenting these things. I mean, I, I'm the first guy I work in medicine now. I mean, I'm the first person that will tell you that I understand that people can get just really sick and, and they need they need, you know, pharmaceuticals or they need, you know, the things that go on surgery or those kinds of things. But I also know that there are a lot of people who need that stuff, but also need uh, spiritual, emotional healing. Uh, a lot of my fellow brothers and sisters, you know, who spent time in, in combat uh, suffering from PTSD need that. I mean, when you're suffering, enduring the number of vets that are killing themselves each day, you know, every so many minutes in our country, uh, it's a huge, huge responsibility that we have to step in and find ways that are that really reach them because just faith-based uh, information it is not answering the question for them. Uh, why? It's that's been there. It's been there all their life. There's lots of faith faith-based belief structures that they could step into if that was what was going to give them the answer. And I'm not saying that it doesn't give the answer to some people, but the vast majority are part of that group, remember, that say they believe in something beyond the physical, but they don't think that they will ever be able to engage with it. So we need to give them something that truly holds their hand and takes them to that place and gives them an undeniable evidence that they can engage with it and that they can benefit with it in some fashion, right? That's just really critical it's as far as I see my mission in this life. Yeah. No, just that, yeah, the understanding is a, a huge part of that. Um, just, just having understanding opened up to them and really appreciate the understanding that you provide um, for, for getting people acquainted with that. Um, and just, on the topic of understanding, um, what would would you maybe care to elaborate to our audience a little bit more about um, what goes into remote viewing? Like what what that process is like um, when they're when they're when they're developing doing this for themselves? Like what what they're capable of? Yeah, I mean, look, I'm not selling remote viewing. Okay? Mm -hmm. Remote viewing is not the end all be all. I mean, I've said that several times already. It's, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and it's not for everybody. Uh, it is the, the thing that I loved about it was that, you know, it was a, it was a discipline born of science by scientists, you know, and evaluated and tested and, and taught in that way. And everything you did was empirically measured. You know, 
And sometimes as a remote viewer, you turned in a 10% product and sometimes you turned in a 60% product, you know, uh, or somewhere in between, or maybe sometimes higher and maybe sometimes lower and different things, uh, would, would, uh, influence how well you did or performed in that particular practice. The thing <laughs> that remote viewing that I loved about coordinate remote viewing is that it was a discipline. It was a dogma that's, and I followed it as a soldier follows it, which says, you know, you do this, you do that. If this happens, you do that. If that happens, you do this and you follow. It's kind of like jumping out of an airplane, right? Uh, you know, you jump out of an airplane and uh, doing a, a combat mass tactical and, you know, you jump out of the airplane and you snap into a body position and, uh, you know, you count 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. If you don't feel an opening shock, you pull your ripcord grip, right? And if you don't feel an opening shock and your canopy doesn't inflate after that, you pull it in and throw it in the direction of spin and pull it in and throw it in the direction of spin. If it doesn't open, you keep pulling it in, throw it in the direction of spin. And you just keep doing that until it either opens or you go, you know, and splatter into the ground. You don't hmm. sit there and go like, well, maybe I count, maybe I should count to like 6,000 this time and see if, you know, if it'll open now, you know, it's not, no. So it, it's a, it was a dogma that I it was able to embrace because I was that that's what we do in the military, those kinds of things. But key for the, for everybody to understand is that once you got through coordinate remote viewing, which was the, the dogma discipline structured process, it was the industrial intelligence collection tool. Think of it that way. It was an industrial CIA intelligence collection tool. And they didn't care whether you were feeling warm and fuzzy that day or you weren't, or whether you were feeling connected or you weren't. They cared all about one thing. You were an operational remote viewer. You were a psychic spy for the government. So you take, go over, do this mission and produce data that's to them something that is quantifiable and that they can put into the intelligence puzzle, right? To start answering things. So it was about production. That's what it was about. What they didn't anticipate in this was that once people began to experience this and see that they did in fact connect with something beyond the physical and that they did it all the time, not just on command, but after you did it several times, you got to the point where you were there, you just opening up, right? The conduits into the unconscious. And so if you can, if you can think of how we were born into this life, I apologize for my dog folks. If you're born into this life, we are born with the ability to see perfectly. That's how the Swedes Swedish pedi pediatricians say, see perfectly, <laughs> meaning you have the neural capacity to speak any language, learn any, any science, right? To read and write any language, the, right? You come into this existence with this expansive, unbelievable neural capability to do these things. And we have, without even being told about concepts of spirituality and, you know, things beyond the physical, children speak of it, not because the children, their parents did or anything else. They just have this connection that's still there. Mm -hmm. and so when we are born into this life, as we begin to walk in this life, we have conduits that go between the physical reality into the non-physical and I'm doing this. It's not really like that, but I'm it just, <laughs> right? So uh, conduits into the non-physical. And what happens is after we start off with it perfectly, we're trained how not to see. We are told what we can see, what we should see, what we can talk about, what we shouldn't talk about, what is real, what isn't real. Uh, and these conduits begin to close, right? It's called, and we go through a real literal process of Darwinian pruning, where we start to shed neurons, right? Our, our biological brain starts going, well, I got all of this. 
and I got to feed it all and keep it all healthy and you're not going to use it. So it starts shedding it, getting rid of it. So mm -hmm. the, all of this enhanced neural capability begins to diminish and diminish and diminish. And our ability to communicate into the non-physical becomes, it becomes a perturbation, right? We get these minor perturbations of consciousness that go up into the unconscious and we get an awareness and then come back down again. And that's where we get these things like intuitive feelings. And, you know, I happen to see something and then I pick up the phone and yep, it's a, you know, I pick up the phone and it, 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 it's, the, it's the person I was thinking about that's calling me. And, you know, a mother thinks uh, has a perturbation up and goes, I think that my son is in trouble and yep, son's in trouble, you know, or, People have said, you know, I knew my father died before my was told my father died. All of those are just examples of these minor perturbations up into the unconscious. And what you're talking about doing through the process of training people, no matter what the practice is, training them, you're trying to get these the time of experience to instead of being this, trying to get it to be this, right? Trying to get a big mushroom experience so that now you're spending as many great masters and teachers do, uh, they begin to walk in both worlds, not just on command, but all the time. You are constantly moving through an existence where you are connected with this physical life and your non-physical self and life and dimensions, right? And then when you really start to grasp the physics of the metaphysics, then you begin to understand that all of the terms that have been assigned to, you know, the great deities in this existence, right? Or uh, of omnipotence and omniscience and omnipresence and, you know, all these things that we are all that, you know, we don't have to go from here to there. We exist in a holographic matrix field, right? Uh, everything is energy and energy is everything. And everything can be expressed as waveform on some level, everything, you know, and we exist in a world where an atom is 99.9% .9 space, 99.9% .9 space. And what's that space filled with? Not mass. It's filled with waveform. And it is, when any waveform travels, not from point A to point B, it travels by every possible path. And we know this. It's mathematical. I mean, we, we have formula for it. Shoot. Yeah. Anybody's crazy enough to go buy it, there's a great book for you. Yeah, some, of them are like, some of them are like a thousand dollars, but I mean, go, I mean, two thousand dollars, I think. But go ahead and buy it. There are other books that cover much of the same stuff, but this is the mathematics of consciousness. Okay, go for it. <laughs> it's, what a degree, you know? So it's when you. You have to be able to do that and to put that stuff in there and, and use that kind of stuff to build that capability so that it's you're not again just promising that you're that somebody's gonna get to that place. You need to be able to show them and help them understand uh, that they are omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, eternal beings existing in a matrix field, right? in a holographic matrix field. It means that no matter where I stand in that matrix field, in that holographic matrix field, I have access to all of the same waveform expression of everything. You want me to give you an example of a hologram? Sure. All right. Don't go to sleep on me now. <laughs> if I take this experiment, <laughs> Let's say I have a little tray and I can I can actually, well, bigger tray, bigger tray filled with water. And in this world in which I'm going to give you this experiment, I have to have the ability to freeze the water on command, right? <clears throat> so when I take a stone and throw it into a pool of water, what happens? Ripples. Yeah. yeah ripples. Well, actually, those are waves, waveform. Now, to our physical eyes, we look at that and we see that it's a waveform and we really don't register, but that waveform actually carries in it information pertaining to the mass and density of the stone, even the texture of the stone that you just threw in, right? 
A smoother, smaller stone produces a different kind of wave than a big, giant half chunk of concrete that you throw in, right? Each thing carries a waveform expression of it through that fluid field, okay? Just how it works. So if I threw three different stones in there, well, first of all, I throw the first stone in, what happens? The waves go out and they hit the edges of the pool, and then what do they do? Come back. <clears throat> they re rebound, and they come back again, right? Now, the effect of gravity in our world causes that to eventually tamp down to nothing. But in a world without gravity, those waves just keep going and going and going and going and oh. going and going. Now, <laughs> I throw another rock in. Another stone goes in. New waveform information. Now what? That goes out and hits, but now it starts to intersect with the other waves. Now I have waves crossing over waves, still carrying information, but now they're crossing over. I throw a third rock in, more waveform information, and now it is still bouncing and reflecting. No gravity, the wave stays there. It keeps going and keeps going, right? Now, that wave is not traveling from here to there. That wave is now traveling by every possible path as it hits and rebounds, right? And changes back and forth through that field in this example. Now we freeze that water. It's got all those waves stuck in it now. And now what we do is we pick that big giant thing of water up and we drop it and it shatters into a billion pieces and we pick up one shard of ice, right? That shard of ice has all of the waveform expression of those three stones in it. <clears throat> in a hologram, what happens is with that same kind of concept, only using a different medium, <coughs> a media rather, you now shine coherent light through it. Now, coherent light, all right, uh, is designed as it's pushed through a, a laser, it's designed to travel in a certain configuration and in a certain line. And through that process of doing that and some other neat little gadgets that are applied to it in a real hologram production, what happens is the coherent light takes the waveform expression, which is now holographically represented through that field, and it projects the images of those stones on the other side, right? You follow me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So now one shard, one little shard contains all of the same information. Go pick up another shard, same information, same information. Well, now, uh, an old physicist by the name of Itzhak Bintov once used that il same illustration. Uh, and his point to people was that you, all of us, from a physics understanding, we exist and a holographic matrix field. The same concept can be applied to just who we are, not literally, but figuratively, right? We exist within a holographic matrix field of this universe. <clears throat> now, is it only this universe? Well, you know, cosmology about 30 years ago started figuring out uh, through the use of dark energy and some other things, which we're still not really perfectly sure about, sort of figuring out that we can start measuring the distances at which sol solar systems are separating. And if we can figure out the rate at which solar systems are separating, and we can then begin to reverse engineer ourselves back to, right, this, uh, what we called our theor theor the Big Bang, or this point of singularity where something pushed through into the dimension. It wasn't really a big explosion, but something just came into being. It just happened. So that destroyed a lot of people's perspectives of the universe because now what we used to think was eternal, now we know if we can take it, reverse engineer it back to a start point, we now know it has an edge on it, right? 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 It's filled, okay. And people are going, well, that destroys the whole idea, the whole concept of, of infinite, of infinite. Does it? What's that? What's that in? What's our universe in? If it has an edge, what's it in? Some kind of container. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, exactly. You see, you know, so now comes this whole concept of uh, quantum foam, right? Of space time, the quantum foam, literally drawn as foam, you know, bubbles interconnecting with each other, little wormholes connecting from one to the other, some going out, coming right back to, right? The same, same universe, same dimension, others reconnecting to other dimensions and other dimensions. And it becomes now a physics concept, true scientific theoretical physics, physics concept of you know, our universe and other universes and other dimensions. And it's not just wild ass speculation, you know, speculating of things. It's, you know, it's, it, uh, people have earned their PhDs on it. Okay. On talking about it and improving it and, you know, either developing the theories for other physicists to prove, or they have been the physicist that is addressed and answered you know, at least in one version. The more you learn about science, when you really learn about science, is that it too, despite even its proclamations of absolute, uh, has a tendency to be very much interpretive, right? And opinionated. I got a question for you, Dr. Morehouse. And um, with that being said, I mean, one, a lot of big, words have been used and a lot of really cool concepts um, and kind of taking it, bringing it back to what we were discussing before with remote viewing in your, and, and even before I even get into that, we talk a lot about um, knowing something. You, there, we've, we've got to move past this just believing and go into a knowing something for ourselves. So would you say that practicing or learning and, and, and practicing remote viewing is one avenue that would allow somebody to know for themselves that this other space, this <clears throat> space outside of time and space exists and is eternal and that we're more than just this. Yeah. Yeah. Because oh. I mean, you can't, you can't do it without that. Right. You can't, you can't do it. You can't be a remote viewer. You can't produce a result uh, without that. It, you are, everything that you're doing there is, is empirically evaluated. And when you're being constantly empirically evaluated, like even in how we teach it today, where when I teach it, uh, is it's empir empirically measured. You're given the protocols and then you're going to be given targets that you're blind or in many you're, you're going to be blind and double blind you won't even know what they are you're just going to be given two sets of random numbers you know that are attached to or you know the concept of the target in the mind of the person assigning those numbers and and then you're going to go through a six stage room, coordinate remote viewing session at the end of it there are going to be trainers that look at your work you're going to give it to them and they're going to look through it they're going to go you know, they're going to uh, capture sketches that were good and they're going to look at your structure and they're going to capture verbal and, and all visual sensory data that's there and they're going to capture it and they're going to put it up and then the whole class is going to look at it and then you're going to be given a video feedback that says this is what your target was. So now the learning cycle is complete. And then some people will go, well, you know, crap, I didn't do very good on that. Yep, maybe you didn't. Okay, <laughs> but what did the class do? Now you would, I take real responsibility for every minute of training time that I do for people. I'm concerned, you know, I, I'm responsible for your experience in that. <clears throat> so I wanna make sure that you learn, right? I'm not gonna just do it and give you some feel good answer. Like, you know, well, you know, tell me what's in my pocket or, you know, some thing and, I have a quarter in there and you tell me that it's lint and I'm going to go, well, there's lint there. Yeah, that was good. And I go through the whole thing. No, <laughs> you know, there is a concept of that target and you're going to produce and I'm going to tell you, or, or the staff is going to tell you, they're going to empirically evaluate what you produced. They're going to look at all of the data criteria that's there and they're going to give you a score. 
And then they're going to tell you what you need to do to practice on. And then it goes back to all different kinds of things. Like, you know, people want to step in and go, well, well how am I going to see? I don't know. Depends on what your, pr your principal modality of perception is. And don't be surprised if what your pr principal modality of perception is, is different than what you think it is. Right. A lot of people go, I'm very visual. And then in remote viewing, where you put to the test of that, then they don't end up being very visual. It's okay. The only way, the way you get better at being a visual viewer, that modality strengthening it is through the, your establishment of intention and then your practice of doing that. So maybe you're very tactile or gustatory or auditory, or, you know, there are, there, there are 50 different modalities of perception. There are only like six principal in the modal modalities of perception, but mm -hmm. you, you strengthen and hone through the practice of doing right and seeing what you produced and you know and then you get to see the cycles you understand that you move in cycles with everything that you do you we move in waveform our perform performance is measured in waveform right so right. sometimes we're down in a valley where we're not doing really well but we we learn from that and we keep practicing and then you know we come up and then we're at the peak where we're we're producing high volume accurate data and then we start back down again right we just keep moving and moving. It's another expression of waveform. So remote quarter remote viewing teaches you that. And then once you learn that, once you understand the physics of the metaphysics about why this works, about how it works, you understand the science, you see that you are no different than anybody else that you, and, and what I mean by that is a lot of people think I can't do it. They step into it going, I'm probably not going to be able to do this, <clears throat> you know, or they're at the other end of the spectrum. Oh, I'm an, I'm a natural gifted psychic. I will, I'll, I'll just clean up on this. I'll be spectacular. And then, then they're not because it's a big equalizer, right? Of, of people of egos, but uh, particularly. So I want them to get that empirical evidence of that. And then at the end of that, we open it to another thing. Now we're going to go to a more, uh, what's called an advanced form of the protocol where we go into extended remote viewing, which is devoid of structure. Now we start dealing with things like understanding intention and how that affects and, you know, how about what the moment is and what that means and what mindful means and what's the, what's the physics, you know, equation for the moment that's been established multiple times before. And then we explain that and show and show how it changes and morphs and where it is and what it is and how it affects to all kinds of things like the Oda loop, the observe, orient, decide, and act, right? The Boyd cycle, as it was called when uh, the Air Force tested uh, an Air Force te uh, fighter pilot, you know, uh, John Boyd, <coughs> Colonel John Boyd, who said that he would never he was able to see on the other side of the moment, just to the outside of the moment. That's what he said. That's he was able to see, perceive what his enemy was going to do before they did it. And once he could see what they were going to do milliseconds before they executed it, he had already observed, oriented, decided, and taken an action in flying his aircraft to be, to be where he needed to be to shoot him out of the sky. And he never lost an air-to-air -air engagement, real or simulated. Anyway, all of these things all come together, and I know we're jumping all around the different stuff tonight, but all of this comes together in, in how you learn it, and once you get the empirical evidence of it, and you can understand it and embrace it, then you, can, you move on to these more, you know, less structured protocols. All the while, understanding remote viewing serves two masters. One is the industrial empirical requirement to produce an evidence of something and the other is what happens through the practice of that which is awakening the human being right mm -hmm. and you are more powerfully awakened in my experience when you have the empirical evidence of what you and or others collectively are able to do with that particular pro with that process right i mean you see that you cannot deny it <clears throat> you just you can't. And I, I mean, I, I might have had somebody who came in uh, to a class with the intention of denying it no matter what. And okay. that's happened, of course. But 
you know, those people are easily identified, called out and dismissed. But if you're somebody that's, you know, really earnestly there to learn, you will, and it changes you. You are not the same person uh, after you have that experience. You just you can't be, right? Because it's, it's undeniable. It's irrefutable evidence of what you are, that you're this eternal being. That's a really empowering thing. And I have not seen anything else, and not to, not to quibble with or minimize anything that anybody else does, I've just, for me, not seen anything else that's, that equals or surpasses that. But there again, doesn't mean that it's for everybody. I mean, some people, you know, are happy to sit and listen to Eckhart Tolle, you know, talk about uh, the now and, you know, and to be folk, turn your conscious awareness and focus every time he rings the bell. I, I we, we both taught the Omega Institute, so I was in the back of his classroom listening one time oh. <laughs> and uh his thing is you know he will lecture and uh then he rings the bell thing you know and, and everybody's consciousness of okay being mindful you know being focused of where you are be here now that's it right that's his practice so talk and the bell and you got to be back there again and you know this was like day two of his five days i think and uh some woman raises her hand and comes up to the microphone and goes, look, are we ever going to move on? Or are you just going to keep talking about the same thing? I just loved it because, you know, it's the whole testimony of it's, it's just not, for, everything is not for everybody. And you just can't say that it's going to be because here's this woman here being the whole point of the lecture is mindfulness and be here now. And she was, you know, when are we going to move on, you know, to the next thing? When are you going to go to the next point in the, in the training here? And it, which everybody kind of chuckled because it, he fell, it fell right into what he was saying, which is, see, you know, you're, you've lost track of what you're supposed to be doing, which is being mindful of being here now, you know, not worrying about what's going to happen next. You're supposed to worry about right now, what you're doing right now. And you failed kind of a thing. <laughs> Yeah, it's important. I think it's an important concept. That's very interesting. Um, well, and that, and we're, we're coming up on uh, on on the two hour mark. Um, so before we get there, I was curious because you 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 hit on the uh, on a point of somebody comes in uh, wanting to disprove um, this concept or this thing. So if if somebody comes in and goes through these protocols, like say they don't speak up and they and they just go through these protocols with you know, I don't, I don't believe, but I'm willing to try it. Um, will they have an experience or will it just kind of surpass them? No. And, and if somebody said that to me, I would say, don't waste your money. I mean, you know, don't waste your money and don't waste your time. In fact, don't waste my time. Uh, because if you don't believe, then I'm not going to be, you know, I'm not going to, guarantee that I'm going to be able to push you over because the statement I don't believe is, you know, is a very limiting statement. Now it depends on what I'm picking up on that person. When that person is saying that, let me qualify this. <laughs> if I think that that person believes in something beyond the physical, but they just don't believe that they can, interact with that, mm -hmm. that kind of person I would be interested in because that I consider to be a mission. But if I think that that person's statement of, I don't believe is that I think this is all bullshit. I think you're bullshit. I think this class is bullshit. And I think that, you know, the whole idea about remote viewing and, you know, he, all, spiritual healing or energetic healing and all this other stuff is bullshit. If that kind of person steps in, don't waste your time. I mean, don't engage with that person because don't think for a minute that you're going to do anything to a person that thinks like that, that's going to suddenly flip a switch and they're going to believe in you. Like, oh, wow, geez. You know, I spent 50 years of my life thinking this is all BS and you showed me that it isn't. You know, thank you. Just five days with you and 
<laughs> I'm good. You know, no, <laughs> it's, and that's why I was saying it. There have been people that have done that. And when they start engaging in that, that's when you start crossing the line because you start lying to people. You start exaggerating your capabilities. You start exaggerating remote viewing's capabilities. You start just making all sorts of outlandish claims that are unsupported in evidence, in science, or in historical practice and evaluation, right? But they just step up and keep saying it because they think if I just, you know, if I just make it that much more intense, this person will believe me. That person will never believe you, right? They will never believe you. It's just like um, David Irwin, right? Familiar with him? Heard the name. I'm not too familiar with like what he's done. British historian. Now familiar? <clears throat> Oh, I yeah. Holocaust denier. Okay, Irwin used to Irving used to stand up in classrooms, you know, because and lay down the big list of all of his books and the very you know uh, the very famous publishing houses that were carrying his books, and he would throw out all of this you know who he is and what he is kind of stuff, and he would wave a thousand dollars in the back of the classroom, right. If somebody was up talking about, you know, anti-Semitism anti and the Holocaust and things, he would throw these, you know, thousand dollars around going, I will give you a thousand dollars if you can prove to me that the Holocaust happened and that Hitler had anything to do with it. Now, I mean, That's wisely, the people that were, you know, doing that with that person realized that there's nothing I'm going to say. There is no evidence I'm going to produce. I could parade a thousand survivors through here and that person's mind will not be changed because that person has for whatever reason, often because of their own beliefs, because of their own relationships, because of their own intended outcomes and their own goals, uh, career or otherwise, that that person decides that they're going to carve out and take a stance that that didn't happen. And you are not going to convince me that it did happen. That individual was sued in court in the UK and was found, uh, you know, his case was dismissed. He, he was actually suing uh, uh, the individual that was, you know, talking about anti-Semitism and the fact that the Holocaust did happen. He sued that person for making the claim that the Holocaust did happen and for uh, telling people that, that he was wrong for saying that it didn't happen. He sued and lost. But still, to this day, the guy still writes about the fact that it, it didn't happen. Even though he was proved wrong in every step of the way through uh, the process. He just refused to accept that it happened. So if you have a person like that that steps into anything that you're going to offer, is it the right thing to do, the ethical thing to do, the moral thing to do to try to take that person on and bring them into the environment where you're going to hopefully reach others? I would submit not. I I, I like how you say that. Um, and because because my mind was drawn to you've got believers. <clears throat> in 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 stuff like flat earth in not going to the moon um where we have so much evidence to it but you're still going to have people that no matter what you do you aren't going to convince them <clears throat> that's their reality that's their belief right um, right flat earth flat earthers are a perfect example of that i mean for some reason these people have decided that the earth is flat i mean i why? I have no idea. But, but I mean, I've listened to and I've actually read their beliefs and their beliefs are just, in my opinion, just grossly flawed and frankly ridiculous. But <laughs> there were scientists like, like even uh, Stanford, Stanford scientist, a Stanford scientist who said, well, you know, their inquisitiveness needs to be acknowledged and rewarded. Uh, you know, so 
<laughs> now you've got a guy who's he thinks that they're completely screwed up and wrong, but he he is saying, you know, to his scientific community, come on now, gang. Uh, we need to we need to honor them as being genuine researchers because they don't believe, and you know we need to applaud that and reward it. Okay, I think that's kind of a of all the things that you could be doing in the world of science, and you know to to change people's perspectives about things. I'm not so sure you would charge that windmill, Don Quixote. There, you know about <laughs> you know going after flat earthers is the thing you're get you need to divert the course of that river. I kind of think like, okay, if that's what you're going to believe, you go ahead and believe that, you know, put it on your t-shirt, wear a hat that says that, you know, hang, I don't care. Oh, they have clocks, flat earth clocks. You know that, right? Flat earth clocks. And so, okay, good. good. I'm not going to waste not two neurons on trying to convince that person that the earth is not flat. I'm just not, going to do it because you know we have a very very difficult road ahead of us to try to bring enough people out of this fourth turning we have to reach a significant portion of the population in order to bring about a chain reaction that will affect where we are as a global society right now and if you look and just take your finger on the pulse of what's going on in the wellness of our planet, in the wellness of the population of this planet, you will really understand what the task is and the magnitude of it before us. And so chasing down, you know, rabbit holes of flat earthers or the skeptical society, you know, or pin and teller, you know, <laughs> it's like, if you can't, figure out that Penn and Teller are not the two guys that should be telling you about how to think in this life. I mean, you, you get what I mean? I mean, if you can't figure that out, I mean, they're funny and they're entertaining and their show, you know, bullshit has, it, it is somewhat popular. And some of the stuff that they put in there is like, you, you can chuckle about it kind of thing, but using them to define what you should do or believe in and the, or, or know in this life or pursue to know in this life. Wow. That's really misguided in my opinion, really misguided because these guys, again, come from a perspective of it's all definable mm -hmm. as a magic trick. <laughs> all right. They're illusionists. And if you know them, if you read them and studied about them and have heard them talk over the years, which I have is that these guys absolutely have, they think that, first of all, that they're really smart, and maybe they are, but they they really mockingly judge and pass sentence upon anybody who doesn't see the world in the way in which they see it, including things like just the fact they can't believe that you're stupid enough not to see the illusion. I mean, I've actually heard him say that. I mean, it's like, They'll do the illusion and people are like, no, nah, I didn't see it. And their response is, how stupid are, how can, how can you not see what I'm doing, right? What I'm doing here. And so people are that way. People are like, I, I don't, I don't get it. And some people of course think, well, it's magic. And other people think, realize it's a trick, but they can't figure out the trick. And they are very judgmental of people across that spectrum, you know? Some of it that they do is humorous and some of it is really nasty and downright unnecessary. So they've talked, stood up and talked about in their class and their magic show <laughs> in Las Vegas will talk about uh, healers and other stuff and call it bullshit to a crowd of a thousand people. You know, it's yeah. really kind of ridiculous and, you know, egotistical in my opinion, to stand up and do something like that. Totally agree. I 100% agree with that. Um, and thank you so much. We're, we're a little bit over, but that's totally fine. This has been super enjoyable. Thank you, Dr. Absolutely. Morehouse. You uh, bet. Yeah. It's, it, 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 and this is a topic that I, I hope we come back to another day because I, I, 
I mean, I hope we, we'll definitely come back to this another day. We're the ones to decide. Um, because it's there's so much we can talk about on this, and we can get mm-hmm. way into the sciences of it, or we can go more of what I don't know. There's so much. Isn't yeah, it? this I mean, remote viewing is just one piece of what I do and can talk about. So we'll talk about a lot of things. And I'm gonna be here with you uh, mm-hmm. on the show as kind of your science advisor. And I'm really looking forward to that. And uh, really excited about the word getting spread. So you're you're generating a large following of people to uh, to come and partake of all the different speakers and the different wisdoms that can be brought to this. It's gonna be exciting. And I really am grateful to both of you for asking me to be a part of it. Thank Same you. here. Same. We're so honored to have you with us. We appreciate you. Yes. And for and for the audience, for you guys to know that this is a this is a wake up world is going to be a, a weekly show Friday, 7 p.m. Central Time. It's going to have myself, Kyle, Jerusha and Dr. Morehouse here as co-hosts. Um, and we will bring on different people, experts in their own way and some people not experts but they have, they're just normal people and they have done something that works very well and they want to share that. Um, and they want to share how that's worked for them outside, not just because, not just coming from an expert stance. So we're excited to bring that to you guys and thank you for, for tuning in with us tonight and we will see you guys next week. Bye folks. Thank you.